Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Saturday Morning Tech. My name is Todd Cochran, and we are getting started here in a very beautiful early morning here in Honolulu. It's uh, just a little bit after 6, and I've got uh, Jeffrey Powers in a very nice close-up on top and Rob Greeley um, on the more, on the bottom. Uh, good morning, Jeffrey. Are you uh, Have you recovered from all your jet lag from going... Uh, West to east, east to west. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I got back. Uh, I got back from San Francisco and VMworld uh, at about six o'clock last night. Um, so I got I got to bed early and uh, woke up to uh, my computers not working. Well, at least, at least my main desktop not working. So I had to do some jury rigging. Good thing I'm a computer guy because I have <laughs> another computer that can take care of things. You know, it's just it's uh it's one of those things where it's just like when it happens, you you just want to, you almost want to like, no, nah! you know, because <laughs> you you know your whole day or at least part of the day then is just uh, is about ruin, and um and when you it always happens at a time when it's 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 not very convenient. But uh, at least I have coffee. That's the important. <laughs> thing. I guess that's right. And of course, we got Rob Greenley on the bottom. Good morning, Rob. How are you? Uh, yeah. Doing great. Great. Great to be here on a holiday weekend. Uh, it's sunny in Seattle today. You know, we must have our our weekly weather report. You, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, here's the here's the sad thing. You know, when you when you have a business of your own, there's no such thing as a as a holiday. And I'm trying to figure out this whole holiday routine. You know, I I was sending emails out uh, yesterday. And I was getting these bing, 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 out of office, out of office, out of office. I'm like, man, sure is nice to uh, <laughs> not to actually be able to have a, I guess most people are going to have a four-day weekend this weekend. So, mm -hmm. uh, or three-day weekend, but those that took off Friday are getting a nice extended weekend, which I guess, you know, if you're having to sit in a cubicle or sit at a desk, it, uh, um, that just... You know, it sucks, but it, it's, I guess that's the way it is for 90% of Americans. So, well, um, let me go ahead here and uh, see if this works. Yep, that works. We're, uh, had a pretty cool announcement over at uh, New Tech earlier in the week. And uh, we're going to cover this on a Saturday, uh, Saturday morning tech show that, or a roundtable that we're going to do. Uh, uh, Jeffrey and I, after pretty much immediately following this sh show, I'm going to talk about it then. But uh, they've come out with what's called the TriCaster 40, and uh, this is a pretty big move by them to to once again support the the I guess for better words the the smaller content creators like uh, like me and. Uh, and uh, this is this is you know I, I went and spent that money building that portable solution that we talked about a while back, and man, I'm just kicking myself in the butt because had I known that this was coming out, um, I would have just waited because it it really is pretty incredible. A single system, well, you know, it's just like any TriCaster it does. Um, it's a four camera system. And it really has a lot of the functionality that I have right here on this one. Uh, the ability to do lower thirds, the ability to run videos, the ability to bring up screen captures, um, be able to do live streaming, the ability to do captures, and all of it in a single box, uh, five grand. And um, if you're looking to put together even more than two or three cameras, um, even to a fourth can, you know, I think the three is relatively easy to do on most hardware out there on re on both PC and and Mac. But once you go to that fourth camera, it becomes a, a challenge. So um, I don't know if you guys had heard this or not, but it shows me at least that at least New Tech thinks that the market for houses of worship and content creators uh, that are on the lower end um, is is a viable market still. So, so your system that you built, uh, uh, wasn't that in the $3,000 range? Well, if you include the Mac, you know, I'm right there. You know, if you, if you really look at the MacBook pro, you know, so let's, let's, let's think about that. What's, what's the cheapest MacBook pro out there cost 1500 bucks or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. 
So yeah. che cheapest MacBook Pro is fifteen hundred, five hundred dollars for Wirecast. That so you're right at two thousand just in software. Then the three thousand dollars for what I built, and boom, we're at five grand. And it's not as capable as this single box, you know. So um yeah, they've they've done a good job on this and uh uh it's Quite frankly, it's it serves about ninety percent what uh, what I do here. <laughs> so would you say that well, it's as portable as yours is? Though? Oh no, 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 no. Yeah. Port portability wise, I can, you know, this one I can load up in a in a backpack and and take somewhere, you know. So um, it it definitely is not not as portable for sure. And what were you gonna say, Jeffrey? Was that? No, oh, I wasn't gonna say anything. Oh, okay. I, I, I like I liked it. I saw it, uh, and it's it's pretty cool. There's a lot of cool solutions out there, uh, in portableness. So I, I think I think your system's fine. So I I, um, I I think it is, but you know, it's not as it's definitely not as. You know, just from a workflow standpoint, you know, I can see where my system. I've kludged some stuff together, and it it'll do, what it needs to do, but um. You know, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of moving parts there, and it, having a single moving part is it, it kind of cool. But um, they made it so that it'll take RCA jacks for audio input instead of having to, you know, go into it with a um, quarter inch, which you know it's just it's a minor difference, but that that opens up world of possibilities for audio inputs. Like it doesn't have an SDI input on the camera inputs, which is good because it's got all analog inputs which makes sense because even the hdmi cameras have uh analog still out of them and composite the difference between composite and hdmi is is very minor but the you know the um you don't have to worry about connectors coming unplugged on a on the analog side because they're bnc's and they snap in and they're not going to come loose but anyway i'm giving up a lot of my discussion here for the round table but uh Two different audiences that I'm, I'm pretty excited with what they've uh, what they've come out with here. But 5K. So Rob, if you're getting ready to set up a video streaming solution, what what do you think you you know would you kludge one together with uh, software and a Mac and some webcams or what would you do these days? Well, I'd I'd probably stay with the. The whole TriCaster model is what I would probably stay with if you know if I was wanting to spend five thousand dollars to create a solution and had a, a a plan to create a show or a network or something like that. I would definitely just invest in the TriCaster. That seems to be the the default solution these days. That's uh, very capable and um, has all of the the things that you need to do to produce a you know a good quality video program. Now, one thing that uh, I didn't think about, but if you're in a like uh, convention s a setting, and where my portable solution is may have challenges, is is you are limited in HDMI runs, length, and if you have a camera that's more than like ten feet away from the input of the uh, switcher, you're you're going to be uh, in trouble. Uh, you're not going to be, you're going to have to come up with a different solution. You're going to have to go HDMI to some solution to whatever your input source is. So, um, so the more, you know, I see now I'm seeing some, some challenges in even, but my portable solution is great for hotels, but I don't know if it's going to work out good because, you know, I did have to do HDMI extenders um, when I was in, when I've done my local streaming event. So that adds, more cost to it with this just the analog inputs uh green red green blue and and you're good or a composite or whatever it may be but uh, um yeah so it's interesting development by them we'll see i'm sure these things are gonna sell like hotcakes so you're saying that if your your hdmi run is longer than 10 feet the you have to put like a power boost onto it is that what you're saying well not a power boost but you got to convert you have to convert from HDMI to, let's say, SDI, and then SDI back to HDMI. So you uh -oh. have to have two converters, or you convert from like um, uh, HDMI to analog. So every time you convert, though, 
you know, you are taking an impact on, you know, you're just hoping that converter does a good job and ups, you know, in doing the conversion. Cause if not, every time you convert, you can have in video degradation. Yeah, so, boss. yeah. So, you know, I, I, I may, and I don't know yet because I got to find out how portable this unit really is. Can it survive check luggage? Cause I can't carry this thing on an airplane. If it can support check, if it can, you know, basically I'm asking them to show me a picture of inside and how they're reinforcing the cards and the RAM and because it's basically a computer with a special couple of cards. And uh, so if they will do that, show me how the guts are made. I'll, but anytime you're dealing with computer fans, there's a lot of risk in shipping, uh, you know, shipping in a, in a, in a, um, um, airplane situation, especially when there's a hard drive involved inside the unit too. So, and it, I know it's not removable. Where the 850, I can take the hard drives out if I want. Are they, but, are they touting it as a uh, portable solution? Oh yeah, and it's you know it's 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 like you know it's not big. And then it should uh, they they should uh, be uh, reinforced. Well, you know, I, I you know on a plane. It's just like anything else. It's, you know, check when you check something, <laughs> you know, you're dealing with yeah. guys that are throwing stuff. You've seen them, you know, and they've had oh, all. Yeah, yeah. They're I've, not... been to, I've been to places where they do the extensive testing and the, uh, uh, yeah, where they, they, they basically bang a, a, a 50,000 ton piece of iron on top of a laptop to see how it breaks so, well yeah i know yeah, i'm talking about the the uh you want to test some gear you'd test it with the uh with the guys that are doing uh, uh <laughs> loading airplanes you know because oftentimes they're doing this sweeping motion it's oh, pull off the cart roll it around and bang on the conveyor and you know it's you know yeah they they don't that's true. I, I do have to admit that yesterday I was sitting on the plane and I was watching the baggage guys throw, uh, throwing the stuff on. And there was, it looked like a clarinet case or something or a saxophone oh. case or something like that. And he literally just did this and kind of, yeah, he, he took about, uh, about uh, six inches in the air and, and it landed right onto the conveyor belt. So, and it, it has big old, the, the thing had a big old fragile uh, uh, sticker right on top of it. So. You know, that's that's where you want your camera on these guys, you know, and you know they're they're getting paid minimum wage, most of them, and yeah, it just sucks. I, I'm, they just don't care. They just uh, they're going through volumes of luggage, right? And they're just trying to do it as fast as they can, right? Yeah, yeah. and uh, so we'll see. We'll just see how it all works out. Um. Oh, someone says I'm on my third Xbox duty United in the chat room. <laughs> so, you know, Xbox seems like it would survive a lot better. You can put that in between clothes, you know. It's not like you can uh, you can hide that a little bit. It doesn't have to be uh, <laughs> up on top. All right, let's switch up here and get into some uh, some some talk here. Um Amazon is ratcheting up pricing pressure in the gadget wars with an advertised supported tablet that will be priced lower. Than similar models, according to people involved in discussions, this is according to the Wall Street Journal. The tablet will be part of a parade of new devices expected at the market with hopes appealing to consumers in a tight economy during the holiday period. So the word is they may be coming out with an ad-supported um, tablet and a couple of models that are more inexpensive than traditional Apple stuff. And I'll be honest with you, I was in a... Apple store yesterday, not an Apple store, an AT&T store, because I'm going to make a change to one of my mobile data cards. And I was just looking at pricing, and I think prepaid is the way to go, by the way. Um, there are some pretty incredible alternatives out there right now. Uh, you know, you walk down, and, and it was just HTC, HTC, Samsung, Samsung, Samsung. You know, of course, maybe some of those Samsung devices won't be on the shelves in a couple of weeks, but um, definitely a lot of Android products that did not look like Android. Interesting. Yeah, I think that this it, this ad supported Kindle is is really not really tremendously new, 
uh, since I think they, they had an ad supplemented uh, version that was less expensive. So I don't know if they're just taking that same model and doing the same thing um, or if it's going to be free or something like that, uh, which I doubt. Hey, Rob, what we want, you, what can I get you to do is uh, aim your camera down a little bit, cut when we get rid of a little bit of that head space between your forehead and the ceiling. I'm, every time I put the lower third on, it's covering your lip. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, Jeffrey, uh, <clears throat> you were just out. Did you see any tablets at any of the events that you were at? Any new stuff or there any uh, hints of stuff that's coming? Well, uh, the big the big thing. Uh, well, I was out at VMworld, okay. which is it's a uh, it's a compl it's basically virtualization. Uh, what I saw was a completely different end of IT, um, and uh, and the biggest thing uh, out of VMworld that I thought that was just completely amazing is the fact of the virtualization is going to be going away. Uh, whereas, you know, like a hospital or a warehouse would have like a thin client system put in because they don't have to have high-end computers into those those areas. Uh, virtualization is now getting into the performance area, and we we looked at a lot of a lot of machines that can handle uh, up to eight people or eight seeds uh, with anybody that does anything with CAD, video. Uh, audio, uh, photoshopping, stuff like that. So um, as an IT administrator uh, or a former IT administrator, I remember when I'd have to, uh, I'd have to go to the people that, that did all the CAD work and I'd build their desktops and it'd be like this super humongous box with all these graphics cards and stuff like that. Now they're, they're saying that you can do away with that and actually give them a, a, a thin client system where everything's virtualized back on the server room. And so that was the that was the big news for me. And I was really excited about seeing how they're going to uh they're going to do that in the future. So basically it's just so is it most of it offloaded then in, in the cloud per se? Because I'm sure that was the comment that's probably Well yeah, they they had the cloud uh, they have the cloud and, and you know they use they use cloud like we use podcasting. Right. It's it's just a very general term. Um, they're now splitting splitting terms on clouds and calling certain like hyper cloud and and, uh, and virtual cloud and, and stuff like that. So everything's kind of getting their own segmented version of that same word. Uh, but uh, it's it's more of a even even you and me think about this. Uh, you, you're talking about taking a tricaster with you, but what if we had a thin client uh, that would add Actually, just set up a box at like CES or something like that, and then we hook up the Ethernet, and that would then port over to your actual TriCaster, which is sitting back in Hawaii, and uh, and we don't we don't have to take a single machine with us, except for that little box. That's that's what we're talking about. Yeah, I think that that's probably headed that way. I think the challenge is is anytime you're dealing with audio and video per se, then you add a level of complexity to that. I know that. Some folks are using some other solutions and are actually using like Slingbox solutions to do that type of stuff, like backhaul video yeah. to a major studio, which is kind of a kind of an interesting uh, interesting move. Hey, you know what well, I they did? Have, Go ahead. They have a new, they have a new protocol called PC over Ethernet, which is what is driving this whole force on here. Now, granted, if yeah, in a long long distance. Uh, relationship between server and, and thin client is not going to be great right now but if if we're all in the same building uh and the server rooms in the same building then that that makes life easier but i i would guess in about five years uh we could we could actually overcome some bandwidth challenges that could actually make this very possible yeah the bandwidth is uh i think from a lot of perspectives is the uh is a big challenge in all fronts. So I, I, I guess we're gonna have to watch and see what happens with this whole uh, tablet space. And of course, we got some big announcements coming in the next few weeks and stuff from a variety of different parties on this. But I think uh, tablets are gonna be have as much of a need. Well, some like in Best Buy, tablets take as up up as much for floor space now as as uh, notebooks do. So it's it's pretty uh, pretty incredible. Hey, I want to take just a moment here this morning. Um, 
want to take a moment and I want to thank um, our sponsor this morning. I want to thank uh, Citrix GoToMeeting. And uh, just like we're meeting today here face to face, um, you know, go to meeting with HD Faces is an, is an incredible product because it lets you meet face to face no matter where you are uh, this summer. And uh, yes, it is still summer in most of the country. You would think that uh, I had to laugh because I'm getting ready to go to Texas next week. And I was looking at this and say, okay, it's uh, September. The temperature is still be coming down. It was like 100 degrees still. So I'm like, oh man, my God please. Um, but you know, with everyone on a different schedule and actually with kids getting ready to go back to school, something stuff is going to start to normalize again. But, um, with go to me, my Citrix, it really just takes a webcam and a click to collaborate in a, and a group HD video. Um, you can even use, uh, an iPad or an Android device as well. So be able to uh, just basically click and, and join a meeting. And, and what's cool is even the person on the iPad can see you or, of the other attendees eye to eye and uh, you feel instantly connected and able to relate and make sure that you're you're hitting on all cert, on all cylinders when you're when you're doing your presentation so it's real easy for you you know all the iPad users have to just go over to the app store and grab it it's a free download over there but uh, just real simple here all you got to do is to get a free 30-day trial is uh, visit go to meeting.com click on the try it free button and use the promo code podcast again be sure to use that promo code podcast. And again, you can try it for free for 30 days on me. And uh, go to me by Citrix is an absolutely fantastic product, part of my arsenal. And uh, matter of fact, we'll be using go to meeting on our tech podcast roundtable here. It just works out great. I can do a presentation, then I can switch to Jeffrey and we can record it right within the app. So we've got an archived uh, copy of uh, what we both did. And that's how we basically put the roundtable together. But Anyway, we want to thank uh, Go to Meeting by Citrix and definitely get that free 30 day trial. So let me switch up here and bring up a new topic. Uh, well, let's 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 stick on the on the let's go back to the tablet for a second. Google, Apple's being rumored to actually have a smaller iPad. And more evidence is coming out, and I think it's just not when, not if it's going to happen, but when. You know, what do you guys think about the? You know, I I I, I don't know if do you think there's a, that big of a market for the middle size iPad? Yes. I yeah uh, I do yeah. So I I was in uh, when when I was flying back yesterday, I went to I went through the Minnesota airport. And I and and I'm putting it up on my website, Dorkazine.com, not Geekazine, Dorkazine. It's another <laughs> website. Uh, there's a there's a new restaurant in Minneapolis, uh, the Minnesota airport. It's called Show You, and it's run by a company called OMG Tech uh, Operations or something like that. Uh, basically, it was a sushi bar that had at each station had an iPad at each station. Where you could set, you basically sat down, you went through the menu on the iPad, you chose the items on the i uh, through the iPad, and then of course you used your credit card, uh, you swiped your credit card, and you got your food. Um, you still had waiters and stuff like that if you needed help. And then while you were waiting, you could actually surf the internet or play a game on the iPad. Now they were using 10-inch iPads for that situation, but I would guess that if there was an iPad Mini that uh, that was rolled out they would easily switch that solution to an ipad mini because those those 10 inch ipads look a little bit bulky um just sitting there on the counters i'm thinking that a general a, uh, a person that uses an ipad uh and needs to have a little bit more portability to it a little more uh a smaller ipad so they can move around a good example. Another good example is I could actually have, because I take uh, two bags or actually three bags with me when I go to travel, and I have my iPad, in my main bag. But when I'm flying, it would be really nice to actually have a smaller iPad to actually pull out and play a game, watch a video, or whatever. Uh, especially in, in economy seating, so I could really see a mini iPad uh, really take off by a lot of masses. You know, I, I, I just, uh, you know, I travel, you guys know, I travel a lot and 
I pack out an amazing amount of gear, and I just don't think I would pack out a, a second iPad. Um, but from a home standpoint, yeah, I, I guess you know maybe there's this huge utility. I I mean business is okay, but you know, Rob, you said you thought there was a market for some smaller ones. You know, I I'm honest with you, I thought that the Note, the Samsung Note, is about the perfect size it would be if i had the samsung note or an ipad that was i mean an iphone that was a little bigger and then the regular ipad you know or vice versa the samsung note and a tablet that was larger that would just uh, you know that you know it's overkill to have both anyway but i it that would be perfect for me you know what's what's your thoughts on the dual sizes yeah i think that the what we're seeing is kind of this um, this kind of experimentation, I think, of the companies about what's the optimal size here for kind of these uh, these smaller uh, phone-like devices. And we may be seeing kind of like somewhere between five and seven inches is where that kind of mini size comes into play and has a, a sweet spot that's really, in a lot of ways, could be a phone replacement for some percentage of the population. I mean, that's how I look at it. I would rather have a phone that was like between five and six inches. So you start thinking about, well, five and six inches is getting pretty darn close to seven inches. Maybe seven might be even better. Uh, I think more and more people are are not using their phones up in their their ear, you know, talking into them. I think that there's there's a lot of social pressure to to use Bluetooth devices if you're going to talk on your phone, you know, in a mobile way. Um, and I don't know. I just think that we're seeing that kind of this, this movement towards larger phones. Um, and I think that's, what's really going on here. And I think ultimately like this, th this mini type of device could ultimately be a phone replacement. Um, I don't know, you know, if that's really going to happen, that, that, that just seems to be kind of my thought of where this might be going. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, you know, obviously that's what they're, I think the vendors are thinking as well, because you look at the Kindle, you look at the Nexus that's, that's out, the Nexus 7, and, you know, they all have a little bit different uh, form factor. Now, I haven't ordered a Nexus. Um, the last um, tablet I bought was the Kindle Fire, uh, trying to uh, reel in my, my gadget buying, but, um, you know, I, I just, I, I don't know. I guess we'll see. I, I like the idea of having a little bigger phone as well, but, uh, you know, just uh, call me crazy, but uh, I don't think I want a smaller iPad or a mini, as they would call it. Uh, we'll have to see how this market shapes up. I, um, well, you have, a, you, have a, you have a Kindle, don't you? I have a Kindle Fire. Yeah. I just, I actually, uh, while I was, uh, when I, while I was traveling there, I, I, there was a store that said, Hey, we have uh, Amazon Kindles for, uh, uh, 50 bucks. And I was like, you know, that's a nice throwaway number for a uh, Kindle. So if it was to break tomorrow, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too worried about it. And it actually, uh, the reason why I got it was because of the fact that I'm a prime member and I wanted to get, I wanted to start checking out books. So I actually purchased the 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 regular Kindle, I guess the first generation Kindle, whatever it was. Yeah. And uh, it's not high power. It it I I can read well with it. Um, I can see the 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 words. It's really nice. And the best part is I was on the plane and I was reading it, and uh, I could just sit there uh, with one hand. My hand didn't get tired. Um, I I I could I sat there and read so, for so about. Did uh, you get the old? Wearing. Did you get the old school one, the original one that they came out with the, with the black and white screen? Is that the one you got? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and actually, in all honesty, that I I think that was a perfect ebook reading device. Some people will say, "Well, I just I like my screen better," but you look how long that battery lasts. That battery lasts forever. I can go on a whole trip and read for almost like two weeks. And never have to recharge that bad boy. Try going, you know, like 10 hours or 12 hours of travel and read the majority of that time and see if, how much battery you got left uh, <laughs> when you land. You're, you're going to be on, on red. <clears throat> so from that perspective, it, uh, it's good. It, you know, I think it's a perfect book reading device for sure. Exactly. Well, well Todd, and I think that 
that could be the reason why I think in the long term these these larger phones may have a stronger play is because uh, those larger screens enable the phone manufacturers to um, put in bigger batteries, uh, which could could last longer. I know. I think I, yeah, I heard some talk that the new Kindle could could last like two or three weeks. Wow. So now in the yeah. chat room, um, someone says, uh, "Waiting for the new iPad. I have a Kindle Fire. Would like a Nexus Seven, but heard they're a little fragile." So I, I I had not heard that, but um, I, I you know I'm almost tempted to buy one. I need a, another Android device anyway to to see what uh, what's going on in the space. Watching try to keep track of what's going on. Actually, when when are we going to have a Windows Phone tablet? You know, from some different. I know that uh, Microsoft's coming out with their product, but when are we going to have some Windows Phone tablets? Uh, do you hear anything in the rumor grapevine there rob that you can actually talk about i i don't necessarily think so i think that the the windows 8 platform uh is as good as the windows phone is uh for that type of thing so i think it's i mean that that's what's going on at the company is the all of the screens and all the devices are being unified uh into the same core operating system so i think it's to draw a distinction between the two is is probably not the the direction the company is gonna gonna move towards. Though though you do have to say that the new Windows Phone 8 does have a little different UI experience than Windows 8. So right. it has those three different sizes of the tiles, where the the Windows 8 <clears throat> really really only has two. So <clears throat> so it'll be interesting to to see, I think that there is something that's kind of in between um, that that may happen. I'm not sure um, exactly. I, I haven't seen any movement in the company that would give 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 me the indication that there's a separate kind of like phone based tablet coming. No. Well, I guess we'll see. Time will tell on this one. Let's let's switch topics. We beat that dead horse. Hey, Apple adds Samsung's Galaxy flagship S3 to the amended Galaxy Nexus complaint. So they're they're trying to get this uh, this device removed as well. So uh, uh, you know, I think it, it could get ugly here for our, for Samsung in a hurry um, with this you know potential injunction. Do you think the judge is actually going to make them remove these devices, or do you think they're that Apple's reasoning here is that it's going to uh, um, cause Samsung to uh, the bargaining table a lot quicker. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely going to happen. Um, from what I have noticed, there most of the devices that are on the complaint are not really all that current or active. So I think some of them may may be impacted. Um, as far as pulled from the market, but a lot of them aren't really even being sold anymore. So I don't know how much it's really going to have an impact. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if there's any impact on future devices or current, current, you know, models. Yeah. And, uh, I can't get Thor thirds right this morning. I keep, uh, putting Jeffrey on, uh, <laughs> on Rob and, uh, vice versa. So, uh, I'm, sleep at the switch here this morning yeah i i think that the you know ultimately i think this is just not good for the whole marketplace um this ongoing patent litigation you know they're very serious about it and you know if a company is so focused on litigation are they focused in innovation and we've heard uh, rumors that uh you know they're making some major mind shifts changes at the uh at their apple stores by, you know, essentially going out and saying, uh, uh, you know, sales, 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 sales versus help, help, help. And I think that's what's made the Mac product line very uh, popular is that my mom could have walked, could walk in with a, with a, uh, with a Mac and say, I don't understand what's going on. And someone will help them, uh, help her get that, uh, you know, get, you know, get her problem issued, but they are going to reduce the amount of uh, a genius bar space to increase uh, 
you know, accessories and that type of stuff, or maybe make room for the iPad minis. I, who knows what the mind shift is, but it's definitely some internal changing within Apple itself, and they're trying to get more out of the bottom line. And that's, you know, they're already pretty, pretty much on a premium scale when it comes to their, you know, their profit margin on their devices. So let me go ahead and switch talking about uh, electronic stores. When was the last time either of you guys were to like a Best Buy or some sort of a fries or something like that? Oh, well, it's probably been a, a good month for me or more. Jeffrey, have you been into one lately? Uh, Well, last week I went to Best Buy uh, to look for a, uh, a tripod. Uh, for my cameras, so yeah, I was I was there last week, um, doing doing some shopping, and seeing you know, and, and of course you go you go by the computer area and you check out the price of the hard drives and and the price of the tablets. So if you have to buy something last minute, you know how much you're going to end up spending. You know the here in Hawaii, I guess you know it's it's different situation. You know I really count on uh, saving money at times by doing in-store purchases as compared to going to and buying if I just need a hard drive for say I, I might have to spend 20 bucks just to get that hard drive shipped here where you guys can go on Amazon and if you've got Amazon Prime sometimes that shipping is is free so it makes uh, you know it's real easy for you to justify buying something online versus buying something in the store so you know for the probably for the the lower 48 um or the continental u.s it probably makes a lot more sense to buy online i think i would do a lot more buying online now there's stuff something stuff i can't get but there's really this huge uh shift going on between uh companies like uh, gamestop uh, radio shack uh best buy heck you go on radio shack half their Half their floor spaces uh, got cell phone sales. There, there must be huge profit in cell phone sales for them to dedicate that much room in their store for it. But, um, you know, here we are, you know, in a, in, a, in a time where we may end up not having big boxes anymore because they just can't compete uh, with the with the online market where someone just needs a warehouse and uh, people to ship stuff in and ship stuff out. I think it would be a sad day if the uh, if the stores went away. To be honest with you, but I don't know. Down. It's going to be interesting. I don't. I mean, I don't think realistically that they would ever go away. But I, I don't know. You know, it's hard to say. As people buy more online, there's less of a market there. And what we may see happen is there's just fewer and fewer stores out there. So you have to. I mean, it'll be more like what Fry's has, where there's just just the spattering of stores around in the larger markets. And there's just fewer. Instead of a 1,000 Best Buys, there's only 500 or 300 or right. something like that. And you have to drive a long ways to get to the store. I think that's probably more likely what's going to wind up happening. Jeffrey, what's, your, the, what's your option there? The, Go ahead. Either that or uh, basically, okay, uh, I, well, I live, in, uh, I live in Madison, Wisconsin, and on the west side here, we have a big box Best Buy store, um, and uh, but it's right next to the mall. And if you go inside the mall, they now have a Best Buy mobile store inside the mall, which doesn't oh. make a lot of sense with me. And uh, at, at first, I thought it was well, maybe this was one of the Best Buys that was actually planning on closing down, uh, but uh, that's kind of come and gone. So I don't, I'm not exactly sure what I do think could happen is something like Best Buy would lose their shop ability. Um, and uh, basically what you would do is you would go online and would say, hey, it's in the store. Go to the store to pick it up. And then you'd go and instead of having a store that you could wander around, you'd have like a uh, front desk, which you would walk up to. You'd give them your name uh, and your, your purchase order number or whatever. And they would then uh, go get the item for you. And while you were waiting, you'd, have a, you'd see a bunch of items through a kiosk or something like that, that if you want to do some sort of in, impulse buying, you could do that there. And so they'd have less employees. Uh, they'd still have the stock in in the town, so you could actually go to a store to get up and not have to wait two or three days for shipping. 
Well, that's one of the things that they're also talking about is that they're trying to implement faster shipping. I think Amazon and everyone else recognizes that people don't like to wait two or three days. And those impulse purchases, if you could, if you could sit on your computer right now and say, man, I need a, ah, I like that. And you knew it could be delivered in two hours. Um, you might, and again, deliver to your doorstep, you, you know, that, uh, that could have a big impact, but uh, employing that is very expensive. Um, knowing what to stock, have in place, uh, it's just like a part store. You know, you order an alternator and say, oh, we're, we'll have that one's being brought from across town. We'll have it this afternoon type of deal. Um, you know, I don't know how many times you've walked into a parts store and had that type of a situation. I, I've had that quite a bit. But, um, you know, maybe we're at that same point with, with electronics. I, I just... Uh, I like to touch stuff. I really do. And, and and then I I generally go back and buy it from the place I looked at it. I don't necessarily go and touch and then go buy online. Sometimes I've done that. But uh, I think maybe Best Buys are tired of being just the uh, the browsing section for people to get educated on products than mm -hmm. consumers going and, and buying it online. Yeah, so, that's true. Well, well, plus also, like the comment that's in the chat room is that we we could see more of a future around uh, you know companies like Apple and Microsoft and and others um, setting up their own chains of stores and going going direct. I you know I think the I think Microsoft is uh, is going down that road. Obviously, Apple is is already way down that road. Yeah. Yeah. All right, going to shift to complete topics here. Um, a major a major cyber locker called FileSonic has went offline after traffic plummets. Uh, the cyber locker described by the MPAA, RAA affiliated International Intellectual Property Alliance um, said that it was an infringing distribution hub. And uh, they were previously listed among the top 10 largest file sharing sites in the world. And uh, when Mega Upload was shut down, which he just got like 4.8 million of his money back, pay his lawyers, um, but they've had a huge decrease in traffic, be largely because I think people got scared that having their their content on these sites, valid or invalid, was was at risk. Now, personally, I'm you know I, there's a couple of uh, file storage sites out there that I use, and you know Dropbox is one of them. Um, but you know, here's the question: Are are you have you guys? It all throttled back and using a offline storage site like, let's say, Dropbox or one of those types of uh, sites because of what happened with Mega Upload? Are you guys not as trusting of those sites anymore? Um, I I have a very limited use for those types of platforms right now. I you know I still have the Windows Home server and and I still. I, I'm still experimenting around with cloud kind of storage of my files. So I'm not really quite there yet. Um, I don't know that I entirely trust it yet, and I'm not sure that there's the capacity there for my needs. Um, so I, I think it's still kind of early days for, I mean, for my personal uses of it. I'm still kind of getting it folded into kind of how I do things. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a little early for that, uh, for me anyway. Jeffrey, any any thoughts? Have you throttled back at all of use of those type of sites? No, not Dropbox. I mean, if it, it, it was something like Mega Upload, there was always a question of you know what what its secure what its uh, um, associations are. Uh, something like Dropbox, uh, especially. I think in the next couple of years, we're going to come up there if if it hasn't happened already that there's going to be some some type of verification system that you'll go to a, you'll like, you'll go to Dropbox and you'll see, uh, you'll see a little badge on the bottom corner saying that it's a certified uh, storage place and, and, uh, and go from there. I don't see Dropbox ever getting seedy. Um, just like uh, some of the other, you know, it, it'd be like saying that iCloud is not trustworthy. It's like saying that, uh, that SkyDrive is not trustworthy which is Microsoft's version of, of cloud drives. So uh, I, I, to me, I, I go for the trusted. I'll go for Amazon. I'll go for iCloud. I'll go for SkyDrive. I won't go for Mega Upload um, 
uh, until they prove themselves. Well, I think that uh, my, you know, my major concern is is the RIAA and MPAA have such a, uh, I guess for a better word, such a, you know, they they looking at all these people or all these sites with the, uh, you know, with a uh, underneath a microscope and. Um, you know, so so let's say they put in some verification system. Well, I have movies that I don't watch all the time that I'd like to archive. And so what happens when I put a movie up in my my Dropbox account and they all of a sudden they get an email say you've got infringing content on your on your website. And, and of course I have a lot of stuff up in iCloud too. So they're at this point, of course, I, the way Time Machine backs up's weird anyway, but um, I, you know, I'm not getting a message from Apple saying I've got movies in the iCloud, which kind of is what it was designed for anyway. But I, I just think it's, it's an interesting time for these, uh, cyber lockers per se. I get a lot of emails from companies linking me to Dropbox and different services to, to pull down, uh, to pull down files. Uh, you know, it's very rarely do I get big attachments in, in email anymore so we will uh have to watch what 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 goes on in the space but uh, uh it's definitely a, a shift for sure yeah hey let's go ahead and talk about samsung's new series 9 prototype that was shown at ifa and uh here was the screen resolution 2560 by 1440 you don't think that they're getting ready for windows 8 do you um <laughs> You know, I, I look at this and, you know, Rob, I'm still, I'm just not, I'm still not sold on the whole Windows 8 motif yet. I'm, you know, I'm having a hard time, you know, really thinking that this is how I'm going to operate my computer here in the, in the next year. Um, you know, you've been running Windows 8 for a while. How How is the, you know, how are you using tiles or are you reverting back to program mode or how how are you using it um well you actually use both so and i think that it's it's a transition really i think in the big picture and i'm yeah i'm curious are you uh seeing some you know some interesting hardware form factors or is it just the actual start menu ui situation yeah you know i'm just you know i'm just uh you know i'm looking at this tablet by samsung and you know it's 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 a it's a nice screen don't get me wrong but you know i I, i'm looking here and i see uh internet explorer i see mail i see uh, a bunch of icons that i I don't know fully know what they mean now but you know i i'm a you know I, i don't know when you have very rarely am I, when I open up my programs, I have four or five things opened up that are active that I'm usually switching between and they usually stay open continuously. And I, I don't find myself going back to the menu very much. And maybe that computing experience isn't going to change, but I'm just, uh, you know, I, if nothing else to me, the, the way the tiling looks on Windows 8 is they just wanted to have something on the front screen that was more interactive than just a uh, background image and well, uh, it's also being being uh really touch first i think was the the real objective right i mean if you look at a lot of the the new form factors that are you know th- that were actually kind of talked about uh last week back in europe um you know a lot of these laptops are are touch touch enabled so you have this this ability to use your your kind of your your pad on the to play with your cursor or you can go directly to the screen and touch the screen so i think you have this kind of kind of new ability with a laptop or a you know a tablet um you know tablet with a keyboard type of hybrid to actually um, start to transition more to what I think more people would rather do, and that's just touch the screen. So I think as you think about, you know, having a larger target um, to be able to touch on the screen, I think is what the core thinking is. And I mean, I wasn't involved in the whole design of this thing, but um, that's, I find it to be a difficult, or not difficult, but just kind of a different kind of experience to use it without a touch screen. 
So I think that the combination of being able to touch the screen um, is is a kind of like a next generation shift for how we use our computers. And I think we're we're doing it with our phones. We're doing it with um, tablets um, now. I think think it's got to transition over to basically all our screens. Um, and that's that's kind of kind of where it's going. It's it's probably not going to happen on our televisions, but but I think um, all all the other kind of screens that we have, you know, that we spend time with are going to be touch enabled. I think is really what the purpose of this is and where it's going. The last thing I want to do is touch my laptop screen and have well, finger, you know, and having I mean, fingerprints on it. I, I don't know. You, you might find that uh, it's much faster for you to do that. Well, it might be faster for me to touch it, yep. but. You know, this, you, you look, how often do you have to clean your tablet screen? You know, and. I don't really clean it that often. I probably should, but. <laughs> have you taken it and looked at it in the light? Uh, it, it, oh, just, yeah. it just drives me nuts to have yeah. a, a dirty screen. No, I know. I know. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't tell you the, how many times I'm sitting in a coffee shop or something like that. And I've got my MacBook. Uh, set up to the left of me and my iPad set up to the right of me and I'm going back and forth and and I and I have the Bluetooth keyboard and it's about basically to do any type of mouse movements or, or select something you got to touch the screen and I can't believe how many times that I go back to the MacBook and I turn around and I and I'm doing something and all of a sudden I'm touching the screen of the MacBook simply because I'm thinking I got to press that button that's fine um, instead of using the mouse so I think uh, I think it'll just become synonymous, and uh, people want it. And then there'll be options that'll have a touch screen and a mouse option. That's what kind of what I like about the uh, about the slate, is the fact that with that with that detachable keyboard comes a trackpad which you can use uh, uh, like a regular mouse. Right. Yep. Well, uh, well, we'll know. Judgment Day is fast approaching for Windows Eight, so we'll. We'll see how how she does in the in the marketplace. Todd, it's a yeah, it's more of a marathon run than it is a uh, sprint. That's right. I'll put it that way. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, I'm sitting here rolling my shoulder. I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but my shoulder this morning is like, ow! I'm it's like I got a kink in it, and it, it's like right there. I've had a couple of weeks worth of sleeping on it wrong, and it's just oh my god, my shoulder hurts. And I got solved on this side. Now it's it's right right in that. There's a muscle there, or something pinched, it's driving me crazy. Hey, Groove Shark. I, you know, I'm, I haven't used Groove Shark, but Groove Shark was um, up on the uh, Google Play for a few days, and it's been yanked again. And uh, you know, so people are like, you know, what's going on with this service? You know, Groove Shark allowed you to free listen, uh, freely listen to online music. Um, and basically, this, you know, the app was pulled again, and I don't know if they're having more legal issues. Either of you guys use this app? I'm, I'm not real familiar with the service as a whole. No, I haven't used it. I haven't used it either. Yeah, I know one of our writers at Geek News Central is uh, a big Groove Shark fan, and uh, so I have to get some input from him. Um, Apple's announcing, or Apple just uh, released a beta of iOS 6 that uh, that have got the app developers a little bit of, they're in a little quandary. Apple has eliminated the old list of app results when you do a search and replaced it with a separate swipeable page for each specific app result. This means you're getting less app results per glance. Um, they say the design isn't without good intention. You get to see an actual screenshot of the app along with the usual icon, app name, price, reviews. Oh, I guess this isn't in the app store. So, um, you know, oftentimes I'll have to scroll through two or three pages of stuff to find the right app because there's so many apps that are almost named the exact same thing. So have you guys seen this, this change to the app store at all? Have you guys been in there? Uh, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I haven't either. But uh, so some people are loving it. Some people are hating it. Typical type of uh, commentary from the uh, the f fan base. Yeah. I, also, there's another um, 
another plagiarism story out there, and I am not at all familiar with this, but it's apparently some guy at Wired has been doing uh, some, uh, some has he got some plagiarism type of accusations. Have any of you guys heard any of this stuff or heard, any, heard anything on this guy? Uh-uh. Uh, is it, is he, it in the news? I mean, uh, is it with, oh, it's with Wired, right? Yeah, so here's, Here's what's going on, um, and this is kind of an interesting development. He's been recycling work and publishing it as new. He's some of it his own work, and um, so we're seeing more of this where journalists are are doing a lot more, I guess, for a better word, stealing or using of other people's content, and. It, I just wonder if it's because we're in this space now where everyone is an author and we have probably more journalists per se or more semi-quasi journalists than we've ever had, why we're seeing a lot more of this. And um, I just wonder if it's because people are having a harder time writing original content or, or what's going on. But, um, you know, we had that guy from CNN who was uh, – basically yeah. taken off the air for a while. There's been a couple, a couple of other instances, but it just seems like this year's been the year of, of people getting in trouble for for, for plagiarism. And I, I'm just kind of curious why. Why are we seeing more of this? Or is it just because people are getting caught because well, there's more tools? I'm, I'm, looking at the, I'm, I'm looking at the article right now, and basically from what I understand, he, uh, his name is uh, Jonah Lehrer, yeah. and uh, basically what he did was he wrote a bunch of articles for Wired, and now he works at the New Yorker. So what he's doing is he's, he thinks, he's thinking that, okay, I wrote these articles for Wired. I should be able to use my own work to, to write for the New Yorker. And, that, and so that's what he's been doing is he's been using his old articles so to write new articles. But the thing is that he wrote those articles while he was at Wired. He got paid for those articles right. while he was at Wired. So I think that the case in this situation is that he's plagiarizing himself, yes, but he's plagiarizing himself from another, from a, a previous employer where that employer paid him to write those articles. So technically, those articles belong to Wired. And so by him plagiarizing himself using those articles, He's actually breaching uh, breaching Wired's articles to well, do that. Well, they've got a, a little spreadsheet up of eighteen articles that he has written um, within the last uh, looks like last year or so, and most of them have recycling flags. Some of them have press release plagiarism. Some of them have outright plagiarism. Some of them have quotation issues. And then there's obviously some factual problems. So the this is this seems to be a pretty uh, you know a pretty ongoing thing for this guy. And so the question I think we all well I we don't know what his contract said with Wired because when I um, when I wrote my book, part of the clause that I included in my my book contract was I wanted to have the ability to be able to take segments of my book wholeheartedly cut and paste um, into my blog. Now, I ended up not using very much, but we came up with language that was appropriate that I could use from my book into my personal blog. And uh, because when you write a book, technically, the depending on how the contract's written, you don't necessarily own the copyright. Um, and the reason you do that is because if someone is out there um, basically violating your copyright, if you're the copyright holder and the, the book company could come back and say, hey, you need to legally go after this guy. And whereas if they hold the copyright, they can use their lawyers to go after someone that's doing copyright infringement. So he could have had, and of course, I haven't read the full article here, but he could have had um, some sort of agreement with Wired that said he could use or reuse or he would might be partially holding some of the copyright to his own articles. Um, but again, no, maybe I, not. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty, it, it'd be like, okay, I've written articles for you right. for gig news central. Yeah. It would be like me taking that article and then turning around and putting it then on geekazine almost word for word. 
that would because you're you're paying me for the article, and then I'm turning around and driving traffic away from your website to bring it to my website with the almost exact same article. That's that's where it comes down, what it boils down to. And in your case, it's it's you're you're promoting yourself from your book to your website, right? And that self promotion is it should be fine. But in this case, he's he's taking an article that somebody paid him to write, right? And then he's uh, and then he's going to a new employer who's paying him to write new content and taking old content that technically does is not his. It's 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 no different than if you worked at a company and you developed I don't know you you do developed a, a fusion a fusion energy and then you went to a new, another company you can't use the what you what you developed at the at the first company to develop it at the second company right that's that's all under the company because under your policy it says while you're working while you're on our time if you develop something that's ours. I think the thing that is um, that disturbs me is just the number of people that are getting caught. And, you know, uh, colleges have implemented for a long time uh, basically doc checkers. And if you have written a, a term paper and you've taken something verbatim out of an article and not provide the right type of uh, attribution, quotation, uh, you know, all the stuff that you have to do when you're quoting someone, you know, they're, they're finding people that are, you know, basically doing a lot of plagiarism and they warn you, we, you know, basically I just signed up to start my master's degree. And that was one of the things that they warned me in my sign up is it uh, said, Hey, the school employs such and such technology and, uh, you know, be careful of, uh, of plagiarism. And it's just one of those little documents I signed up for, you know, that they made me sign as part of the process of being a student again. So, um, kind of a the schools are doing it, and journalists know that they're not supposed to. I just don't understand why it's become such a big issue all of a sudden again. Well, I think that uh, this this particular problem had kind of two things going on. It had this whole thing of of re reposting, you know, an article and two different kind of blogs. Uh, which I can see where this guy kind of gets the impression that that it's probably it may be okay to do that because uh, so many articles are kind of like um, syndicated now, right? So you could kind of draw, and I'm not saying this is right, but I'm just saying you could draw this conclusion in your mind that it's okay because you know these articles could appear in multiple blogs anyway, right? And plus, it's also the kind of uh, news cycle um, around content online is so fast now, right? So you spend a week writing an article and it gets posted to, to one blog and then it gets buried in the archive, right? It, and it's never to be seen again. But maybe that content is evergreen, right? And it has stuff in it that's that has long-term uh, uh, relevancy. But since we've turned into such a what's latest and what's hot, um, those articles that are evergreen tend to fall out of the relevancy uh, and it's more difficult for people to, to find, right? Um, so I think that there's a lot of issues at play here. This this pick of the guy actually was doing true plagiarism. I mean, he was actually using other writers' um, content word for word. Um, so he was actually doing two things. He was actually really unethical on both sides of this. But I think that kind of this this news cycle that we're on now is so fast now that I think writers want to see their their content live longer and and um, and ha add value over over the long period of time. So it's just that's just, you know, that's my kind of comment on all that. All right, wanna to switch topics to something that's a little more seedy. CD. Uh yeah, seedy. More, more CD. <laughs> uh, there's a uh, article at the Daily Mail. Co. Uk. You know, if I'm quoting an article from the Daily Mail, well, you know that we're onto something uh, seedy. Um, not to saying that they're a seedy website, but they 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 do a lot of you know these types of uh, flashy flashy articles like this. And I'm here's the title: The Dark Side of Instagram. Thousands creating X-rated Insta porn with popular photo app. 
So what's going on is that Instagram is becoming the place for teenagers, adults, and everyone else that likes to show their naked body. Uh, sexting, sexting it, stuff. Right? Yes, yeah. there, there's a term. What did they use? They called it sexta, sextagram is what they're calling sextagram. it now. Yeah, sextagram. <laughs> and, um, and they're basically a team at Instagram are so overwhelmed by these posts that uh, they don't, uh, don't know how they're going to handle it. Now, there's obviously issues with um, young adults or teenagers uh, putting inappropriate material online. So, I, 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 you know, this is Instagram's issue to deal with. But what, where have we gotten to the point where, you know, it's just like, here, here's a picture of uh, my body and the whole world can see it. And people are just like, you know, it's like, we, are, have we turned into a, a world of exhibitionist or, 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 or what, you know, it's, is there, is modesty completely gone? Am I getting too old <laughs> to understand <laughs> why, you know, why people would want to do it? First of all, believe me, you do not want me putting a picture of myself up on inst Instagram. That's just, <laughs> Uh, I will puke myself, it. right? So I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I was doing an episode of iPad 365, and I actually recorded the episode um, outside the studio. I was uh, I was on location, and and uh, so I I did this uh, this video, but I needed to do screenshots of the uh, of the program. So when I got back to the studio, I set up the iPad. Um, and I set up the camera next to the iPad, and I turned on my lights and and everything else. And I started uh, I started doing video of 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 the uh, app, and uh, and I and I got it all ready, and I was putting it on, and I was doing the mix down, and then all of a sudden I realized something, and that was that uh, when the when the iPad actually went to a completely black screen, that it it could it actually reflected. <laughs> what it was seeing uh, in the background and uh now i wasn't i wasn't naked or anything but i did i did have no shirt on right. when i when i went to record the uh the ipad segments and so every segment would would then uh flash back in, on a, a totally black screen would then show <laughs> me uh, pretty much topless and, and i was going um i don't think anybody wants to see that so i had to turn around and actually re-record it so <laughs> Um, there's, there's a lot of weird things that people do, uh, see that and, uh, they go, well, I could actually do that, which is why we had the, uh, which is why we had the eBay and the YouTube reflection porn going on. Um, and what do they call it? Where something happens in the b background right. of a picture, uh, <laughs> there's an actual term for that. And I can't, uh, a mirror or something, hand. you know, that? yeah, where you get that mirror effect. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Now here's uh um you know here's an instance that happens here so we get done with the uh I get done with my show at at night on uh, Monday Thursday nights and and lately we haven't had a lot of trade wins so I I put the system into um basically I switch it to net 2 and it brings up the actually I don't have nothing queued in there right now brings up net 2 and it it brings up the uh the replay and I start the replay so what do I do? It's it's eighty degrees in here. First thing I do, off goes the shirt, right? Because I'm trying to cool off and uh, turning gear off and everything. Well, one night I was sitting here, and uh, lo and behold, little did I know is I had accidentally hit the um, the auto button with something, and I changed to the transition of the office with me sitting here with my shirt off, and it was uh, it went on for like. 10 minutes and of course we're doing replay at like four o'clock in the morning and uh so i get this email from some disturbed viewer he's like dude <laughs> uh, i was watching your show and all of a sudden it switch and you're sitting there with no shirt on he says uh I, I about puked. How <laughs> he said he said how come so why what are you trying to do and, and i just like Oh my gosh! And when I, you know, I realized, oh, no one saw that. No one saw that. But it, you know, again, you never know uh, when you may involve, you know. It, but some of these are very obvious. Uh, but um, I guess society has changed, and I'm just, 
I don't see the idea of uh, even when I was younger, you know, and I would say I was in the uh, being fit in my fittest condition of life. Um, I still don't think I'd have put pictures up on the internet. I just don't understand it. I really don't. But well, guys, uh, I mean, all all we have to do is get in the gym and get uh, get our six packs back again, <laughs> and uh, we can uh, be be with the cool kids. Hey, Rob, and that's then, and then I have to take a razor to my whole body. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, Rob, the the going to the gym, um, you know, to get six packs back would be, uh, I'd have to quit doing this new media thing, and because I, <laughs> it'd be require a lot of gym time for sure. But <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, Instagram has now become uh, Insta porn. A lot of places, you know, this is just it's out of control, and. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, we've seen it. We saw it with eBay. We saw it for a short time with YouTube. Um, yeah, as people uh, figure out how to game a system. Yep. I remember even flipping through Ustream channels one night, and there was this one woman uh, sitting uh, sitting in front of the camera, and I thought it was a uh, uh, it, it was something overseas because she had like a black uh, I don't know what they call it though uh, the cowl where she's wearing with, right. uh, with her face covered. And and they're talking, and all of a sudden she she takes the the lower half of her shirt and does this, <laughs> and then and then lowers it, and it's like, really did did that just happen? So, so she she didn't as, want as, she didn't as want people her... game this yeah as people game the system. We know that it happens, and and they know that if there's there's a bit of sex involved, that they're going to get more viewers, yes. and that's yep. the that's the bottom line on that. I have one episode of Geek Smack. That I look at my YouTube numbers, and that that uh, episode of Geek Smack is like got like ten, twenty thousand views more than any other episode or all the episodes combined. Um, and the reason why is because I, I had sex in the title. Wow! So they know that it's going to game the system. They know it's going to gain popularity. Right. Well, do you guys uh, do you guys have uh, pancakes and maple syrup? Did you guys hear about this uh, Quebec maple syrup heist worth $30 million? They're worried that the worldwide market of maple syrup is going to be uh, affected because they this big warehouse got jacked. No, I didn't hear about this. I'm a big maple syrup fan. <laughs> so they're the, 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 uh, the, the maple syrup consortium is really worried that this, this hijacking of $30 million worth of maple syrup is going to cause de- – um, disruption in the maple syrup so what it is is they've been holding back on us rob and uh fear <laughs> <laughs> gate <laughs> man i tell you oh. hey uh old uh albert einstein he continues to be uh to be uh you know eul- eulogized in his theories so a gamma ray photon observation indicates space time is smooth Seven billion light years away. Yes, seven billion years ago when you were a young lad there, Rob. A gamma ray, a gamma ray burst occurred. The observation of four Fermi detected gamma ray bursts has led physics uh, uh, physicists to speculate that space time is indeed smooth. A trio of photons were observed to arrive very close together, and the observers believe. These are from the same burst, which means that there was nothing diffracting their pass from the gamma ray burst, gamma ray burst to Earth. So basically, they're saying that uh, you know these things have traveled a long way to get here, <laughs> or a long time to get here, and they arrived uh, relatively at the same time. And um, so interesting. It uh, so that we means have a welcome ceremony. Well, I, you know, they didn't know they were coming until they were here and gone. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is kind of an interesting uh, uh, revelation by them that, you know, there was, you know, from that, you know, you think about that really seven billion light years away. That's it's just out there, little ways, and uh, for that light, or that gamma ray burst to have, you know, occurred, and then those uh, particles. Arriving at the relatively at the same time makes you makes you go hmm because um, just shows that uh, they're not going through a wormhole or anything like that. They're not doing any type of uh, anything crazy out of the ordinary to speed up or slow down. And, and believe me, I don't know how they figured this all out, but uh, they did. 
So they uh, just cruise along at 186,000 miles per second. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if that's how fast they actually. I guess I, that is speed of light. That's right? the speed of light. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, that is the big science news that happened over the last couple of days. Um, so people are asking on Mars Curiosity why it has no microphone. Um, they saying, okay, you got all this, uh, um, this cool stuff on there. Why did we not put a microphone on there? And what are the real sounds from the surface of Mars? And so, uh, so Todd, are we thinking that, uh, the Curiosity rover could have been a podcaster or something? Is that why we need a microphone? <laughs> Um, I, well, main thing is people want to hear what Mars sounds like. Oh yeah. Uh, and, uh, it does have an atmosphere, so it, it makes sense why they, uh, why they went and, uh, why they went and put it, I guess it would just be the sound of wind, you know, yeah, and, kind of um, but they did have, you can, you, li you can listen to the sounds of the winds of Titan uh, they did that during when the, when they launched the uh, Hugens probe back in 2005. So uh, I I just don't understand why they didn't do it with Curiosity, and a lot of people are asking the same question. So hmm. after all, microphone wouldn't take up too much room. Aren't they afraid that uh, there there might be a Martian nearby, and and if this is public? If this is a public stream that uh, that's that everybody's all of a sudden picking apart the audio, I think I heard somebody say bloop bleep blop or whatever. Well, maybe they're sitting out there saying, "Hey, what what are we gonna do with this thing? You know, should we tip it over?" <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think um, seriously, I think that the reason why they didn't do it is that there there just isn't very much um, valuable science to well, have that. Probably true. It's and you have to justify every. Everything that's on the doggone thing, it's cost per ounce, I think. But it's, yeah. um, but they is returning some incredible images. I don't know if you guys have looked at some of the images lately, but uh, pretty incredible. Hey, I'm going to yeah. uh, wrap this down here in a few minutes, but I want to talk about Oracle. Um, Oracle fixed the Java bug that they had known about for four months, but they fixed it so bad they've introduced a new bug that basically uh, allows people's uh, PCs to completely be taken over. Um, and I'm just more than anything, I just want to warn people to, for at least a, a time being, uh, disable uh, Java. They've got some major, 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 major issues. Uh, have you guys been following this? Yeah, I've been seeing a bunch of, uh, well, I shouldn't say, I mean, on a regular basis, I've been seeing updates to the Java code. But, yeah, I mean, it's hard to stop using that stuff because it's, it's, it's pervasive out there. I mean, you know, lots of sites use it, right? Well, they're saying that this bug is so severe um, that if you land on the wrong web page, and if you're probably going to web pages you go to on a constant basis, you're probably pretty safe. But if you're out there just doing Google searches for stuff, and yeah. you're, you are, you know, you're at risk. And it, this is so bad that just landing on a page with a browser and it's it's done. You're they own you. So um, just be aware that that's out there and it's this new. This new patch is not uh, not necessarily a good patch, and uh, they've got uh, major challenges ahead still. Keep your antivirus update, right? Well, it's not even you know they it's more, it's more than that? yeah it's you're 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 going to get owned. It's so severe. It's just it doesn't matter if you've got current antivirus or not. It's it'll get around it because it's basically some flaw in the Java infrastructure that it originally it wasn't so bad but now they can just they can drop in a rootkit and in, in your own so yeah some say must have java need to play minecraft in the chat room so yeah, I saw that. <laughs> isn't uh isn't open office uh to, to have open office you need java on there uh you need a lot of java needs it runs on a lot of stuff so you know it's uh it's one of those things that's kind of an integrated part of our, you know, browser society. So it, it's tough. It, it really is to decide uh, what to do. Have you guys, I, I want to move off the tech su subject for a minute. Have you guys noticed, and it's just driving me crazy. Um, 
And actually, I made a comment on Google Plus about it yesterday. And here's, um, here's what I said. I swear, some people are sane. In other words, they're sane until they open their mouths about politics. If, if you, is it just like it has gotten to the point of... Well, there's so much lying going on. And, it's, and people are like off the chart nuts. I mean, not even having... Re, I mean, they're saying stuff and you're like, I know that person. They're saying that? You know, and it doesn't matter what side of the fence. It's a, both sides of the fence are just... I find it incredible what people are, what's coming out of their mouths. And, you know, it's just like, do they not think that that's not going to piss 50% of, the, of of their friends off? You know, I, I just, uh, some, if it, you want, if, if you want, if you really want to have a presence in this world, go into politics because that's <laughs> the most. <clears throat> It's the most mudslinging. It's the most, but it's also the most watched out of everything. Yeah. But we could sit here and complain about the commercials that happen during uh, during election season, but then we're sitting there after we complain about this commercial we just saw. You're talking about We're then about sitting it. there for the next twenty minutes talking yeah. about politics, and it doesn't matter if you if you love it or hate it. It's you know talking is one thing, but it's the it's the vitriol. It's the it's yep. the nastiness of some of the stuff people are putting on Facebook, on Google Plus. I mean, just incredible what there's and it's just to me, I'm just like, you know, I can handle the, you know, this is funny. And some of the stuff was funny, you know, this there were some funny things that happened last week that um, you know, it was pretty eye opening and hilarious. But long story short, you know, there's the and then there's just this outright nastiness and you know, I, I had a, uh, I got an email from a, from a podcaster and he said, Todd, I was stupid. I started talking politics in my show and he, he had a tech show and we're, here we are talking politics. We're trying to stay nonpartisan. <laughs> the, um, he said, I started talking politics in my show and I lost 50% of my audience. He says, uh, uh, politics, religion, uh, basically are, you know, should be off limits for, um, for most content, but I, I don't know. I just find not, not, not totally. Well, for him, yeah, probably. But you know, then you get uh, you get some of these people that are open. Uh, religion, perfect example. Uh, you get people that are open on the religion. Cliff Ravenscraft being a perfect well, example. Well, but the thing is, um, he's he he knows. You know, that's the crowd that he caters to, yeah. and his audiences. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And I, you know, yeah. Cliff does great stuff. But it's the you know, I don't think Cliff is is uh, touting any religion in his tech show. No, he's not. No, no, you know. but he he will he will at times uh, go off on a small on a small. Oh, a tangent for uh, saying. Yeah, and and talk about it, but you know, once again, his audience right, is right, also right. They they know it's going to happen. Yep. So if if you come well, out he, of the blue, that's a different. Yeah, story. yeah, he keeps it rather. Generic though he talks about spirituality and inspiration and right belief and th those kind of issues which are not specific to a you know denomination yeah. Right? yeah um so I think that that's the advantage and I also think that this is kind of indicative I think Todd you you touched on kind of a a, a nerve of what's happening just in a broader sense even right, with right, technology right. and sports I, I I would say politics is very much. Um, like the the vitriol that exists amongst um, sports too, right? Sports and even technology. I mean, you think about you know our our history between Apple and PCs, and now it's between Apple, Google, and and Microsoft, and how there's Apple fans out there, and there's PC fans, and then there's Google fans, right? Yep. And they're all like after each other, trying to prove their point. And I think that's that's the same thing that we're seeing with politics but for some reason politics it it goes to a whole new level yeah people are willing to lie and deceive and cheat and and throw people under the bus i mean just in in a much more aggressive way around politics than, than they are even around sports even though i would say that probably world soccer or world football 
tends to be a pretty violent uh, issue between teams. <laughs> there's <laughs> some history. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I think that there's a history of this across a lot of other areas other than just politics. But I, I 100% agree with you that, um, but from a podcaster perspective, um, raising these topics also can get your audience more engaged too, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think if you walk that line carefully and not alienate, yep. but but inspire conversation, I think there's an opportunity there too. Now we talk, you know, we talk about politic. I talk about political issues on the show when it comes to legislation and that kind of stuff. And yep. and uh, I think I've been a pretty equal opportunity basher when it comes to you know both the the previous yep. administration, this administration, and both sides of the fence when people do stuff stupid. I and I like to yeah. call them out, but, um, yeah, it's just, I just, you know, I just, sometimes I'm seeing stuff now on, on, especially, uh, Facebook and Google plus, and I'm just like, huh, you know, and you're like, I would have never expected something like that. And you get a d gain, a new perspective on, uh, on people you thought you knew. So, um, and I, and sometimes it's not good, yeah. you know, it's, it's definitely not good because, it's just like wow, that's uh, off the and it's in a book and not, and I'm not just talking about people that are. You know, there's two ways to look at something too. So let's say you are a, um, uh, on the Democrat side. Let's say that you're pro Democrat, and someone is, uh, you know, spouting something against the the Republicans. Um, even if you're a liberal, there's stuff that you see coming out of people's mouth. You're like, huh. You know, it's 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 not. In other words, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing people that are on both sides of the fence, and no matter what your political persuasion is, it it would kind of like, blah. You're like, wow, that was disgusting. Um, so it's just it just makes you makes you wonder. And if you can tell people are pretty. Uh, there's a lot of pissed off people out there. That's for sure. <laughs> on both you know, sides, social media gives people voices. That's that's. How it works. You know, there's a lot of pissed off people, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, and I think that the the real threat is um, people not being informed right. and yeah. believing people's falsehoods. And, yeah. Um, and, and I think that's going on a lot in politics today where, where I mean, it's probably okay if the mudslinging is based on reality. Yeah, but it's usually but not. There's also it's <laughs> there. What what what's bad is when the mudsling is based on a a falsehood or or an exaggeration or a distortion. Well, uh, I think it's very very damaging to our our kind of um, our our government and our culture. Well, you don't see Congress rushing out to shut down super PACs or any of that stuff. You know, they're out there. You know, they haven't put anything forth. You know, they allowed uh, the corporations to donate as just much money as they want. So you you knew when that was going to go on that it was just going to get worse. So I don't think we've seen nothing yet. Just wait as we get closer to the election. Yeah, yeah that's, that's gonna... true. <laughs> now, uh, on, on, the, on the reverse end, I think that we could actually have some really cool stuff come out uh, for podcasts. I know uh, four years ago when I... When I uh, started, I was doing uh, Geekazine. I was doing the Geekazine QuickCast, uh, which I, I pod faded after a while. But I would do these. Uh, they were all segmented. So it would be like one week uh, on one day I'd, I'd do. Well, it, that's where the day in tech history came from. It was, a, it was a weekly thing. Every single Monday was a day in tech history. But uh, during the election back then, I actually did uh, uh, technology and politics. And I had people on the show that talked about. Um, how technology, like for instance, one uh, one episode we were talking about using uh, Twitter and, and Facebook in promoting a president or a senator or something like that. Right. And then uh, another episode we talked about uh, voting and uh, if if voting uh, could be something that could be done off of a mobile device or if it still had to be go to the uh, local fire station or school or whatever and cast your vote that way. So. I think that we could we could have some great topics on it, but then yeah, with with the great topics comes the people that just want to get their name across and and uh, and throw out mud and and, uh, and go from there. I gotta show you guys something here. Uh, you know how people put. I don't know if I can do this. Can I do this? 
Let me make this smaller. See if I can bring this over. Yeah, I can make this happen. You guys, you know, everyone's putting cat pictures up on the internet, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so here's one for you. This is going to end the show in a actually end the show on a stinky note. <laughs> here's a skunk. A baby skunk licking a kitten. And uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen the, this. the title of that was, I guess there is Leapy Plapu or whatever it was. You know? <laughs> you know, I was like, oh my God. You know, it's just like, well, you know, <laughs> where do people find this stuff? You know, I'm just, this just came across my Google Plus. It's scrolling, you know, my Google Plus is updating and I see this come across the screen. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. It's the title of this. It appears Pee Pee Lapu does exist. Oh my god! <laughs> Baby animal porn is what you call it, right? Oh my gosh! It's like people putting their pictures of cats and stuff up. I'm, just, oh, people love their animals, which is <laughs> which is cool. <laughs> All right, yeah. So, uh, sorry to interrupt your train of thought there, Jeffrey. But I just saw that. I'm like, oh my god. And this has been a disjointed show from the very beginning. Actually, kind of tough, a uh, tough show because the news has been kind of weird, and everyone, uh, everyone had uh, vacation on the mind. One uh, question before we go, sure. and, and that's directed to both of you: uh, Server 2010, they're going to have, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, 2012. I think I'm getting the right yeah. year here. Uh, they're going to have the big announcement on Tuesday. Well, um, and uh, what are, are you guys? Have you read up? on that Are you expecting anything or i have not read up on it uh are they going to sell it with the device or just going to be software well it's just a, it's a software it's a software upgrade um where i'm going to be actually doing a hangout and then i'm going to be talking with a couple industry experts at the a, afterwards uh on a uh, on a podcast i do with uh, calvin zito over at hp and uh, we're going to talk about the new features coming out with server 2012. Rob, you've been following it? Uh, no, I haven't, but I, I certainly need to. I mean, I would love to have a, a, you know, a new version of my Windows home server. If that's what you're talking about, um, Jeff, is that new version of the software that I, uh, you can run, run in your home network. Um, it's kind of expensive. I know, is that what you're talking about or just in a, general sense mm, about no that was that was the big buzz at uh, vmworld yeah. uh, well one of the big buzzes at vmworld was server 2012 was going to get they were going to do an announcement on tuesday and okay, well, uh I, and like i said we've, we've scheduled uh with a couple uh bloggers and a couple industry uh industry people and uh and you know we're just going to talk about the features yeah i'm i'm really hoping that they come out uh with an affordable piece of hardware that uh you know, that you can put in your home that will do a really good job of doing a local cloud as well as a, you know, backup to the cloud kind of scenario. Um, yeah. That's what I hope. I don't have any inside information. and that, That's a completely different side of the company. Well, I tell um, you, Windows Home Servers paid for itself for me multiple times over. So I'm a big fan. I, but, you know, it's, yeah. this is a whole yeah, new, yeah, this yeah. is a whole new dealio. Yeah, yeah, it's time to move on. I mean, I've had mine. Yeah, I have an original one. You know, I've upgraded and I've put in new CPUs right. and new RAM, and I've I'm, kept this thing thing alive for many, many years now. I'm on uh, my second box. Yeah, it's just time to it's time to retire it and move on. I mean, it's it's going to be sad to kind of move on from it because it is such a cool little little piece of hardware. If as long as they make the backup stuff automated, just like it is in the current Windows Home Server, I, I think it'll be easy to migrate. But if there's no automation to it, you know, if I don't have to think about it, because I don't want to have to schedule backups or anything like that, I hopefully they've kept that part of it in it. Yeah, I hope so too. Some sort of a client that runs, you know, on the desktop. Well, uh. Someone's asking in the chat room, did anyone order the 40 yet? Uh, the TC40? Uh, no, have not ordered it. I uh, wish I hadn't built my portable studio with the, the other parts, to be honest with you, because I probably would order it. But uh, it's either I'm going to have to eBay my my portable studio. I bet I probably could do okay on that on eBay. 
uh, might uh, might consider that. Might consider selling it and then buying the buying the forty. You know, but if you sell the Black Magic uh, device, let me know. Oh, I I will. I'll let you know. But I'll probably. Hey, Todd, I, are you um, still planning on doing a doing a total remodel of your studio there? Well, the plan is to. I've ordered some new uh, shelving back here, and yeah. um, we're going to do some basically just some aesthetic upgrades. There's no more, thank God, no more hardware upgrades needed um, from a hardware standpoint. And I'm hoping this. I'm at the hardware level point for a number of years. I just don't hope I have to buy anything more. I've got two pieces coming from B and H that finishes me out and uh the one that it was a black magic box it was just released uh finally is shipping um let's see if i can tell you which one it is and this i haven't seen anyone do any reviews on it yet because it's been uh it's been waiting to be shipped let me get this uh site of products it's called the bum, 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 bum. it's the ultra studio express and uh matter of fact they haven't even updated their website on it but it is shipping and um this basically what this box does is takes uh sdi or hdmi capture and playback through thunderbolt so what i'm going to be doing is we've been i've been waiting and see the tricaster does sdi out so I've got a, a Mac Mini down here that I'm going to be using for my secondary stream. So right now we're streaming on Amazon, and I want to be able to secondary stream on Ustream or whatever other service. Um, so when I ran the wiring the way I normally do through the ADVC box, the one from uh, Canopus, the uh, Grass Valley solution, um, I wasn't happy with the video that uh, was coming up in Flash Media Encoder on, on the Mac Mini. So my goal here is, is to have a really pristine um, image coming into the Mac Mini that I can use for my secondary stream. Um, and that's going to take me to the point of being 100% uh, digital. I will have no longer, the only thing I'll have analog is this camera, and that camera, everything else in the studio is is digital. So a complete digital workflow. Um, there is some analog on the audio, but uh, that's more of a you know a, a need and not necessarily an issue. But uh, you know once that is done, then there will be no more analog. Well, there'll be analog feeding you guys. You guys are getting uh, your feedback video is uh, four by three analog. That's so that pipe will still be uh the same and really what the what you guys get is a feedback is coming through those canapas converters so i don't know how the video looks on the you know what you guys are seeing on your side but um that was the quality i was getting in the mac mini and it wasn't good enough yeah you're um uh, you're actually frozen on my skype on this end oh really how about you jeffrey are you getting uh getting any video I'm well, I'm getting video. Yeah, it's it's actually probably about a second behind. Yeah, yeah, you're getting the the return loop. Yeah. So, but anyway, so we'll see when this uh when this comes in, and uh, thank God it's you know I'm, I'm my bank account can start to recover. Um, <laughs> you know the the really the upgrade in the tri the Skype system was a lot more money than what I thought it was going to be. I didn't completely plan that out as well as I should have, and. Uh, it, it 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 cost me a little more money than I thought I was gonna spend on it because I got into it and I was like, oh, I need this, oh, I need, oh, I need that, oh, uh, yeah, you know. And the next thing you know, it's like, oh, and we should just kept the old box and uh, you know, we're not getting sixteen by nine half the time when I've got two people on, so I really didn't get any increase in uh, in efficiency here from uh, you know, supposed to be HD. But, you know, I think when you guys are up on the screen, you look pretty good. And a lot of it has to yeah. do with uh, what you guys are actually um, using for cameras and lighting and so forth there as well. So, so. Yeah, and, yeah, and it, I mean, occasionally it goes full full widescreen. So, yeah, it's got to be a bandwidth thing. It is. 
my biggest challenge right now has been is my underwriter for my insurance. I've been having challenges there, so I'm going through the process of uh, getting a new insurance company to insure this separately um, just because of the, you know. The value. Yeah, the value. And, uh, you know, the guy's like, you know, I sent him the, the figure, and they're like, how can you have that in a 10 by 12 room? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you're welcome to come over and take a look. You know, it doesn't take too long with cameras and everything else. You start adding it up. You're like, oh, my God. So um, boys and their toys. Yeah, you are a boy with toys. Yeah, so all all we have to do now is just improve the talent. You know, it's next next thing is, you know, to to replace me. And (laughs) that's not going to happen anytime soon. I got (laughs) to keep working. Uh, but, uh, and it seems like everyone else is doing good. I, I talked about on the last show, Leo Laporte said they're going to do $6 million this year in revenue. That's so pretty good. that's sound. That's not, I think that's gross, not necessarily net. And, uh, you know, hopefully we get some of the TPN guys, uh, to, uh, how should we say a line tighter? You know, it's just makes sense, but, uh, you know, you try to push something forward and boy, oh boy, it's, it's a pain. All right, guys, uh, we need to get off in here. I got to turn this studio around and we'll do a thing, a, a round table with, uh, with Jeffrey. And yep. uh, I might even leave the, uh, the stream up and running. So if folks want to hang out, you can do that. Um, but other than that, thanks for hanging out here on Saturday Morning Tech. It's been our pleasure. You can find Rob at robgreenlee.com or any place else, Rob? Uh, just at uh, Twitter, um, at Rob Greenlee. So. Those are the best places to find me. And, of course, Jeffrey, you're over at uh, geekazine.com. You can find me at geekazine.com. Of course, the website, uh, Day in Tech History, which is a daily rundown of tech history. The new website, howtorecordpodcast.com, if you want to get into this fun little thing that we call podcasting. And, of course, my Twitter handle is geekazine. You know, Todd, maybe uh, you should probably uh, write a couple articles on how to record podcasts about your uh, about your setups, your, your mobile podcast and stuff like that. Yeah, I've got uh, articles up on uh, Geek News Central on them already. So if you want to link to them, you can. Um, but I've got. S- can I can I plagiarize it? Yeah, you can plagiarize it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that those believe it or not, those that one portable system has gotten a lot of traffic. I, that I've done very well on Google on that one. We. We get a lot of traffic on that particular article. So don't call it the same damn thing. (laughs) (laughs) So, all right, folks. Uh, Anyway, geeknews at gmail.com. Twitter me at geeknews. And uh, we'll see you next week. Well, let's see you next week. Yeah, I'll still be here next week. Uh, Getting ready to uh, travel out to steamy, hot Texas. I'm uh, going to be on the move a lot. I'm going to be traveling uh, every other weekend. or every other week for probably the next couple of months. So I uh, signed a, yep. a new uh, consulting gig and uh, going to be uh, on the move quite a little bit. But everyone, take care. We'll see you. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, see we'll see you next time on Saturday Morning Tech. <laughs>